Photography Online, the podcast. Coming up on this month's podcast, we discuss UNESCO's declaration that selfie tourism is destroying historical landmarks and discuss the alarming slump in international sales of new cameras over the last decade. We ask if the DSLR is dead, we debate if there is any point to depth of field apps, and we decide if the world really needs an auto-leveling tripod and a Lego camera which you build yourself and can actually use to take photos. And now, please welcome your hosts for this episode of The Photography Online Podcast. A man who thought Annie Leibovitz was the lead singer of the Eurythmics. It's Harry Martin. Is she not? And a man who is so into his Japanese cameras, his favorite band is the Fugees. Oh, come on. It's Marcus McAdam. I thought that was quite good. And here to keep them both in check, it's Ruth Taylor. Hey everybody, welcome to the October podcast. I'm Ruth, host of the show and of course of Photography Online as well, here trying to hold it all together and everyone all together uh, in more ways than one. This month we have got Harry and Marcus in the studio. Harry finally back in the country. He's been off on the gallivant, as we mentioned on our live show uh, recently. Harry's been in Africa. How was it, Harry? Oh, I mean, it was fantastic. Any time I'm in Africa... I'm pretty happy. I was there for oh, just over two weeks. I think I came back with about 8,000 images, which I uh, I don't know when I'm going to get around to editing those. That's a lot of film to develop. Yeah, well, exactly. I know. So, uh, I mean, I think it I think it would probably take longer than uh, the, the, doing all those digital images than you would to develop a couple of rolls of film. It's going to take me probably the rest of the year just to whip through some of the shots but I've, I know I've got some that I'm really happy with it's uh, it's just picking them out and yeah and getting them edited but um, you, you'll certainly see some I've got I've got content for the rest of the year but yeah, Africa just is one of those places that gets under my skin and I am actually going back in December and obviously I'm going back in April for Namibia for the photography online adventures trip which I'm so excited to run that will be the first time we're heading to, to Namibia I know I haven't seen you in person since you've come back, Harry, but you don't look like you've got much of a tan, have you? Is it just the light? Am I not seeing it properly? You were out there for nearly a month. Uh, slightly, but uh, it was hot. But the sun, strangely, is stronger here in Scotland. It, you'd be quite unusual to burn in southern Africa. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, well, I was, in, so I was in Shetland in July, hence why I wasn't um, around for any of the shows and the podcasts then. And we were all getting sunburn in Shetland because it's it's so far north and the sun's really intense. Yet we were in the sun in Africa and we were absolutely, you know, obviously you still wear sun cream, but the sun's nowhere near as intense despite it being uh, significantly hotter. So Marcus, you obviously have been away as well, not quite as exotic as Africa. Where were you? Well, I was uh, in Donegal and Northern Ireland, which, you know, it's exotic if you're listening in Africa. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Now, I've got a, a funny story, actually, because I was, uh, as expected, shooting on film and uh, I was co-leading a workshop out there. So we had eight customers and they were all shooting digitally. And we were all set up at the Giants Causeway and uh, a couple of them had battery problems. So they, they had to change batteries at the crucial moment. And I was saying, saying look, you see, you should be doing this, you should be shooting film and then you don't have any battery problems. And then forward wind to about 20, 30 minutes later where in the blue hour. So the sun had now set and my exposures had got quite long into like you know, 10, 20 seconds. And I needed to look up the reciprocity failure time of the film I was using to work out the, but my phone battery had died. <laughs> so, so I was going, has anybody got a phone? And they're going, why, what's wrong with yours? Go, the battery's died. They're going, ah! <laughs> So yeah, I had to eat humble pie with that one, really. Brilliant. So we're going to carry on with the podcast, but just got to mention uh, for Marcus and Harry, the previous show that we did, which was last month, obviously, with James and Nick, was our most popular show of the year so far, which means obviously ever, because that's all we've done. So no pressure to live up to, guys. Uh, but people love that, because we can't have them bragging about how they got the best listening figures, or else, as Marcus knows, they'll be asking for... A bit of a pay rise. No, I'm not having that. So come on, everybody. Tell, tell your friends, spread the word, get on your social media and uh, get them to listen to this podcast. Because if we can't better James and uh, Nick last month, then uh, might as well give up and go home. 
Well, they've got one less. I haven't listened to it. Well, okay, perfect. Well, don't don't listen to it and listen to this one twice. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys can prove yourselves. We've got a few news stories coming up to start off the podcast. Number one, Harry, what have you found? Well, we're we're back to our beloved topic of uh, anything related to selfies, and so we've mentioned we've mentioned this over you know many months, but this is now essentially an official statement from UNESCO. And well, interesting aside, I never actually knew what UNESCO stood for, but uh, it's United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. I did just never look that up. They are they are now saying that a lot of historical landmarks in their UNESCO sites are at risk of being destroyed as a result of selfie tourism. You kind of gathered that might have been a thing, but it's now an official term with a definition that's different to traditional tourism. So UNESCO defines selfie tourism as the practice where travellers visit destinations primarily to take and share photos of themselves, often with iconic... La- I like how it's often with iconic landmarks in the background. So that's actually that's actually secondary, but it's to take photos of themselves in these nice places. Unlike, of course, just traditional tourism, where you're just going to, you know, capture personal, personal memories, um, you know, see nice places and, and spend a bit of money. And... I don't know, I kind of I'm just I shake my head at it that we now need a term for this and that this is now another problem in the world. And they don't this this particular news piece doesn't uh, mention any specific locations, but, uh, you know, we can start to, to gather and guess which locations are going to be impacted. And we've talked about some various places over the last few months. I think one of the towns in Italy, where they had to introduce a fine for people that were loitering, taking selfies. There was the there was the convenience shop in Japan, wasn't there? Mount Fuji as well. That's that's right. Yeah, there was another town in Austria that was uh, is supposedly the inspiration for the movie Frozen, which I know is one of your favourites, Marcus. And I've watched it several times. They they had to erect a fence to block off the view onto sort of this nice series of houses and a lake and the mountains. Wow. They ended up having to take the fence down. Um, they they were they got into a lot of criticism about it and here they, they did take it down, but they're they're still trying to find ways to prevent because it's causing so many issues in the local town and it's disturbing local people. People were there at all hours of the day and night. I mean, just so does the fence prevent line of sight to Ursula's castle? Yeah, yeah, that's they they literally blocked off or had done it. I say they have taken it down now, but they had to they physically blocked off the entire view just to stop people coming and taking pictures. And and let's say they they did they ended up taking it down. And I don't know what solution they're going to look for now, but. Um, I did just say that as a joke, by the way, because Ursula's castle doesn't exist. But never mind, it went over your head. That's fine. <laughs> well, but it's the inspiration, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. But it, the thing is, you see it all the time. And so only last week when I was in Northern Ireland, I went to uh, a place called the Dark Hedges, which was made you know, famous, uh, apparently, in the Game of Thrones. I don't watch the Game of Thrones, but apparently since it appeared in the Game of Thrones, <laughs> it's yeah. become incredibly popular. And when we were there, we got there before sunrise and we were the first ones to turn up. But not long after we turned up, this, well, two busloads of, I think they were Chinese tourists. They were, you know, Far East Asian tourists anyway. Um, and they all came. And of course, they've got every right to be there, as much right as we have. But the the difference is, is that we were there to take a photo and admire the beauty of the place. Whereas they were there literally to get a selfie. They didn't care about anything else. All they wanted is a photo of themselves posing, funnily enough, with their cameras. So I noticed, because we were waiting for the light and we said, look, while we're waiting, you can jump in, take your stuff, but on the condition that once the light gets good, you get out the way. Um, So we were standing there watching them do all these selfie photos, taking photos of each other. But one thing that struck me is the fact that they all felt the need to pose with their cameras. So as though they were kind of like guns, you know, so they had them over their shoulder <laughs> in their hand. as It's a new hunting trophy shot. It, it, yeah, it was. And none of them seemed to be taking photos of the trees themselves without anybody else in it. And it's just a, a striking difference in, you know, we're both there. 
we've both got just as much right as each other to be there, but we're there to take a photo of the scene itself. They were there to take a photo of themselves in the scene. So it's a real, you know, real difference in kind of approaches. Well, that's that's the case. It's it's the the reason for being there and the the impact that might start to have. And I think the the level of that sort of selfie tourism and the nature of it, uh, people trying to be in, in one spot in particular has a lot of impact in, you know, in terms of just uh, either erosion or traffic and being in towns and cities. It's just a different, um, yeah, different impact to say, yeah, that traditional tourism where you're, you're simply enjoying a location or a place as a whole rather than that specific narrow view. Yeah. And the problem is, is that only one person can get their shot at any one time now. So if you've got a list, if, if you've got a line of 40 people all wanting to take a photo of something, they can pretty much do it all at the same time. Whereas if you've got people wanting to take a photo of themselves in the scene, it has to be one at a time. I don't know what the, the solution is to, to all of that. It's, it's just ban selfies, make, se- make selfies an illegal pastime. Not entirely sure that's going to float across the world. This is another one for you. If I were the king of the world series, which we're going to start, I think, next year. Well, I was going to say ban social media. So No, the, the penalty of taking a selfie without written permission is death. <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, let's move on from that story uh, to another fun one. We've, I say fun. I, I came across this and I thought this is going to be a good talking point. It's a serious job opportunity. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is looking apparently for a senior official photographer or an official photographer. Marcus, what, what's your take on all this? Senior. Does that does that rule me out? Well, no, Harry, I was actually going to suggest this to you because the salary... Uh, is 44,500 to 48,243 pounds. So you could triple your salary if you get this gig. That is pretty good, actually. Yeah. Do I have to live in London, though? Uh, well, you probably do. But I, from what I can gather, it's basically following the prime minister wherever he goes. But you'd be working for the digital team at the prime minister's office. And they are at the forefront of communicating how government policy impacts the lives and people throughout the United Kingdom. So does that sound like a... I'm just telling telling lies, really, aren't I? Exactly. Um, now, the role offers an experienced photographer. So, I mean, you know, technically you're out there, but, you know, let's just assume that you're still OK. An exciting new challenge playing a critical role in capturing the daily activities of the Prime Minister, Cabinet Ministers and events in 10 Downing Street. Does that sound exciting? It does, it, it does sound quite interesting, actually. I mean, it's one of those unique opportunities. OK, well, let, let, let me go on and you... Let me go on and you'll be put off in a minute. This is one of the incentives for the job, by the way. Obviously, we've got the salary, but if that's not enough, then this next thing will really get you excited about it. Your work will be seen by millions of people and has the potential to make a huge impact on their lives. I mean, the novelty... Mine doesn't already. The novelty, Harry, of of having anybody see your images should be enough, (laughs) let alone millions of people. So they're playing on the fact that a professional photographer would care how many people see their photos. Why would somebody who's got experience in taking photos and therefore presumably been published in many magazines and uh, um, whatnot care how many people see their photos? That's the kind of thing mm. that you dangle, the kind of carrot that you dangle in front of somebody who's never had any photos published before. Is that why you're trying to sell it to me? Exactly. Um, now, this is the bit that will probably seriously put you off. Uh, it says you will need to come up with creative ways of telling stories of how the work of the government impacts people's lives and simplifying complex policies to cut through with the general public. What? At that point, I'm out. That's not a photographer's job, is it? Well, yeah. Exactly. That's that's now media media intern, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And it says you will work with a range of internal and external stakeholders, including ministers, press officers and special advisors. Basically, you're going to get everybody telling you to do different things and it will be impossible <laughs> to keep them all happy. It sounded initially interesting. Call me cynical if you like, but I can guarantee that whoever gets that job will be out within six months. Well, they might stick around for the salary, but I doubt they're going to be enjoying it. They're not going to have creative fulfilment, shall we say. No ICM in that job, Harry. You were doing better that recently. <laughs> well, even in London, that's not, I, that's not a particularly high salary. That's That's just about median sort of paying your way especially if you're having to spend a lot of time in uh, Westminster and uh, you know in that area well I don't know if you're working with politicians and I guess you just get all of your meals for free and and your travel for free and expenses don't you but you well you can claim claim for anything on expenses if you're working in parliament yeah great 
new camera. Doesn't appeal to either of you then? No, I think I'll stick where I am. Thanks, Ruth, on the Isle of Skye. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take the I'll take the lower salary. All right. Well, let's move on to our next story, Harry. This is a camera specific. This is all around Nikon. What have you found? Well, it caught my eye because it said uh, Nikon has sold more Z9 cameras in its first year than any flagship in the past 15 years. And I, initially, I sort of saw that and I thought, wow, that's a, that's a pretty sort of big statistic. Any sold more than any flagship. But of course, being uh, the media and a little bit of clickbait, um, it was a little misleading. It's uh, more properly interpreted that Nikon sold more Z9s than any of its own flagship cameras. So it's, uh, it's, it's D series of cameras, the D3s, 4s, 5s, etc. But even considering that, that's a pretty decent achievement because those leading Nikon cameras, the D3, the D4, they brought out the S line of those cameras as well. They were the industry standard for a, a long time. You know, it was racketing back between uh, the Canon 1D series and the Nikon D series over, you know, 15, 20 years. But for them to outsell those older cameras is something pretty impressive and certainly something they needed after some of their sort of financial woes and i mean they seem now real back on the uh, on the forward foot with it all and that z9 when did it come out uh, what were you now 2012 it's 2021 the z9 came out and we've just had the canon r1 announced earlier this summer back uh, uh, at the end of july and i would say that the the z9 is still up there is you know, essentially competing with that in terms of specs and what it offers professional photographers. Yeah, you know, despite the the R1 coming out this year, it's um, four year, nearly four years advanced on the Z9. But Nikon's done a fantastic job just bringing software updates and the fact that it's a really good base camera. I mean, I I've been tempted several times to. Um, sort of move to the dark side, as it were, and, and pick one of those up. Really? I, I thought mean, it was Sony that you were being dropped. He's, he's coming away from Canon, I think. Well, I don't blame him, Ruth, to be honest, because all these big brands, they, they go through peaks and troughs in terms of where they're competing against each other. And it doesn't move very quickly. It takes years for one brand to dominate um, and another brand to be seemingly struggling. But the brand who's seemingly struggling, you know that they're going to come back at some point. And over the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years or so, Canon have certainly been the, been the more dominant of the manufacturers in terms of their products that they've released. And as a Canon user, um, I've always been, you know, pleased to the fact that I've chosen Canon or had chosen Canon as my brand of a digital camera. But from what my observations are recently, Nikon are definitely making better advancements than uh, Canon are at the moment. And then, of course, you've got Sony in the mix as well, which, you know, 10, well, 15, 20 years ago wasn't uh, a factor. Um, and then you've got other people like, you know, Fuji as well. So there's, there's more than two players in the mix now. Uh, so they're all fighting for a smaller portion of the pie. But if anyone is on the up at the moment, it's definitely Nikon. And if anyone's on the down, I would say it's definitely Canon. I'd be inclined to agree. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm I'm still more than happy being on my, you know, I came away from, from my trip in Africa with plenty of images I was happy with. The camera performed fine. I'm very happy with the lens that I've got. But of course, you you always think, oh, the grass might be just a little bit greener on the other side. And I mean, I, I've looked at moving for other reasons more than just the camera and the, the lens choices and the fact that I like to shoot wildlife video as well that you know, sort of makes other options potentially more appealing. But I know so many people that are um, utilising those top-end Nikon cameras now and fewer people being impressed with, you know, the newer cameras that Canon... Uh, there's certainly, I look at the R1 that was, was announced and... Yeah, quite impressive some of the specs, but it's certainly not something I look at and go, I need to upgrade to that to improve my photography, and certainly not for the for the cost of the camera. The the Z9 as a flagship camera is is so competitively priced. Yeah, I think a lot of people, Harry, were not necessarily disappointed, but I think underwhelmed by the announcement of the R1 because I think expectations were a lot higher than what they've actually delivered. Yeah, they almost shot themselves in the foot with the fact that it, it took so... They, they deliberately 
released no information, no teasers, kept it, kept people waiting so long for any little hints. So, of course, it got built up in people's heads and uh, they were they were deliberately really on tight lockdown with the, the specs. And so, of course, when it come out and, uh, and they announced the product, everyone kind of thinks, well, yeah, it's not quite as good as what we'd dreamed up in our heads and yeah uh, you know if somebody gave me one i'd be very happy to use it and i'm and i'm you know it's it will be a very very capable camera but as with many of those flagship cameras they're they're only designed to be used for very specific purposes yeah. but i feel on the on the other side the nikon flagship the z9 is certainly a lot more appealing to a broader range of photographers than the the very small niche that, you know, the Canon One series, whether it's SLR or mirrorless now, seeks to occupy. Whereas that Z9, you know, I think that ticks the box for a vast majority of shooters, whether it's landscapes, sports or wildlife shooters compared to the to the R1. But I mean, anyway, we've we digressed a little bit into... Uh, well, another, just to finish off, another, another important factor, I think, in the you know the claim that canon is on the decline and nikon is maybe not is that canon have been so protective over the licenses for third party lenses to fit their rf mount yes, and yeah. i i know personally four or five people who have ditched canon just purely for that point and i can't I, I, you know it's easy for me to sit here knowing very little about you know the, the financial side of and the running of the company but just from where i'm sitting on the other side of the world i just think that decision is absolutely bonkers now of course i know you know, i don't know everything but personally if i was going to buy a new system tomorrow it wouldn't be canon and it would be largely based on the fact that i wouldn't be able to buy you know sigma lenses or tamron lenses or any other lenses for it well, speaking of like cameras specifically, you found an interesting story, Marcus, which is talking about the actual decline of cameras themselves over the last decade or so. What, what exactly are the figures that you've got um, on your side? Yeah, so Japan's Camera and Imaging Products Association um, has released figures for camera sales for the last uh, 12 months. Uh, to cut to the chase, the final figure, which I believe includes all camera types, is 7.41 million. So 7.41 million cameras uh, around the world have been sold uh, in the last 12 months. Now that may sound like a big number, but it's actually an 82% drop in the last 10 years. So I don't know how good you are at mathematics, Harry, or Ruth for that matter, but does 82% drop mean that it's only 12% of, uh, sorry, 18% of what it was? I'm suddenly, you see the steam coming out of my ears. So from what, I, I mean, I'm, I can't, I'm not reading this in front of me, so I'm just going on what you said there. So that's based on the figures 10 years ago, they've now, it's an 82. Yeah, it's 82% down on what it was 10, 10 years ago. So does that mean it's only 18% of what it was? That would be the, the logical assumption. But yeah, so that's that's a humongous drop. And so that so you said that covers all cameras. So that's compacts, bridges, SLRs, mirrorless. Okay, so apparently it's made up of 1.52 million compacts and 5.89 million interchangeable lens cameras. Right. So this is obviously due to the rise, I'm guessing, of the... Because pictures... Picture taking has gone way up in the last 10 years, but cameras have gone down. So the phone, the smartphone. Yes, so everybody's using their phone, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but yeah. apparently camera sales went up slightly after COVID. Um, but in the last year, they're 38% down on, on what they were the previous year. So it's gone, it, the trends reverse suddenly. Yeah, well, I, I can only see that carrying on, to be honest, like, you know, with phones getting so good with shooting. And, and for the most part, that ticks... The boxes for most people. Most people don't need a big SLR or a mirrorless camera, and the fact is, if you're if you're interested in photography, then it's that interest in the medium and the the techniques. That's the only reason, really, to actually have a camera. Because for the most part, you probably could just do it all on a phone. Absolutely, but that's that's the one thing that smartphones cannot offer. So if you enjoy the process of going out and taking photos a smartphone isn't really going to scratch that itch very much, is it? Because you don't have all the controls that you would on a fully manual camera. And that surely is the enjoyment of going out and trying to use the, the equipment. Oh, 100%. I would be really interested in the, some of the interpretation of those, those figures, whether that's including secondhand 
sales figures because maybe the I don't think it is I think it's I think it's new new sales only so yeah I wonder how the how the second hand camera market is developing the reason I know that there's no second hand figures in that is because if there were I've probably bought more than 7.41 million on my by myself <laughs> that's true that shelf behind you is filling up really quickly <laughs> but uh, but yeah no it's 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 sad really that it's such a declining industry but Going back to uh, previous topics which we've covered, I think it's largely the fact that camera, all, all camera manufacturers are struggling to come up with incentives for people to buy new cameras and they're just adding gimmicks that nobody's asked for and nobody wants um, and they're failing to provide what we actually you know, do want or could use. I think it's with the fact that it, it could be seen as a dwindling industry. I'm not sure necessarily a drop. Obviously, a drop in sales is a bad thing for companies and you know lower profits and whatnot. But it means they've got a far more targeted demographic and customer base. And the people that are interested in photography are still interested in photography and will likely be so in another 10 years, another 20 years. And so as long as there are uh, some new blood coming in, and I think... If you develop that interest in photography, you're going to go down that route anyway, regardless of, you know, gimmicks or what phones can offer. Hopefully, it will mean that some of the camera companies just continue making or start to make even more just just targeted, just photography products, less of this hybrid um, camera video, you know, any um, new digital tools, but AI. just, you know, camera, camera, an AI, a camera, just cameras for photographers, you know, I think if they stripped stripped it back and started making just basic tools. They would have lower costs because they're not they're not having to put so much technology into some of these cameras, and um, and I think it would probably appeal to a quite a broad range of people. But again, you know, what do we know in terms of large multi billion dollar industries? We had this conversation on last month's podcast, uh, obviously with James and Nick. The Superior Months podcast, apparently. You guys are competing, remember? So go back and listen to that one if you want more information. Or don't. On, uh, just listen to our... this one twice. <laughs> go back and listen to that one uh, for more on, on kind of cameras and what they're putting in them and what they don't need to be putting in them and what's winding various people up. But their final story for this month, actually, is on the same kind of vein. We're talking about smartphones taking pictures, talking about AI. Um, Harry, what's the last story that we've picked up for this month? Yeah, it does, funnily enough, lead on quite well in that, you know, Apple with a with a drop funnily enough in their sales of phones and losing a little bit of the market share of their iPhone and of course the iPhone to Apple is you know just I, I think it makes up half their sales it's such an important product for them and they're always looking to try and well innovate in inverted commas with it but uh, the the biggest catch I saw was the fact they've put in this new camera button on the side which, and in fairness, actually, to me, looks quite good. I like, you know, a, a, a tactile button dedicated to taking a picture. So the, the new button on the side of the iPhone will launch the camera dedicated so you don't have to use the touchscreen or go and unlock the phone and find the camera, all this sort of thing. It also has a, a touch element built in, so you can slide to change features on the camera using this dedicated button. And that's, that sort of thing actually would would appeal to me. You know, it's, I, I use my phone a lot as well for photography and video and would probably make life a little bit easier for me but their biggest sort of bank and the way they're trying to sell it is on uh the ai features they're putting into it oh good and to be honest all of it goes over over my head i mean i don't know i don't really understand what the ai features are that they're trying to sell other than well, I, I think we need more ai in our lives to be honest because i'm i'm not getting <laughs> enough of it but no i mean th this is the way things are going and you know ruth you've got a new car only this week <laughs> and you were saying to me yesterday how it's got ai features in it and it's driving you absolutely bonkers already it's driving me crazy it's such a good running car it's everything else so it's like it, it sees the road signs but it, it, it'll see a 40 it'll go oh you're going over 40 but it doesn't see the fact that the 40 is for heavy goods vehicles it doesn't see a 321 sign it just sees a number it, it, it's driving me absolutely crazy and things like I just got out I was rushing to do this podcast I was saying earlier I was running a little bit late so I, I kind of switched the car off and immediately 
beep, beep, check the rear seats for occupants. I'm like, there's nobody behind me. And I'm trying to yank the key out and the key needs a special turn to get it out because it's an anti-thievery thing. So, you know, by the time I rock up here and see you guys smiling faces, I'm, you know, sweaty and irate with uh, technology in general. But yeah, no, I agree. I just, I'm so sick of it. I'm so sick of it. I like the idea of the button on top, but because that's tactile, it makes sense. It saves you having to faff around and try and find this button on the screen, which half the time your thumb doesn't quite reach. But that's a good idea. But everything else, I don't know. I'm just, I'm over it already. I know, but this is the way that things are going. So we've got you know, AI in our cameras now. We've got AI in our phones now. And we've got AI in our cars now. So you just can't get away from it. And I, for one, I'm not speaking on behalf of everybody here, but I, for one, don't want it. I never ask for it and I don't want to use it. But if we're forced to use it, then like you are when you're driving your car now, you can't go past a, a school without your, cam uh, without your car saying that you're speeding because there's a big sign there saying 20 when flashing, but it's not flashing. Exactly. But the car <laughs> exactly. doesn't know that it's not flashing yes. and it just reads the 20 and goes, oh, you're going too uh, fast. Beep, 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 beep. It, it would drive me insane. Uh, yeah, your blood pressure goes up and and then you're more likely to be road ragey. But Harry's looking very calm. What are your thoughts, Harry? Well, this is I'm very calm because I bought a 15 year old Land Rover that, <laughs> that, that regularly breaks down. And so, and I'm also way... very calm, Ruth, because I'm using cameras from the 1960s. There we go. <laughs> and antiquity, I, th I, I now agree with Marcus, antiquity is the way <laughs> forward. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, let's leave our news stories behind for the day. As I said, there are um, plenty more information on that on previous podcasts and stuff. So uh, jump back and have a look at some of those. We're going to move on to, to our next feature. The big question. It's a question and it's big. It is a big question, but just before we move on to this month's last month, as I we were just saying, uh, we were talking about further technology, te excuse me, technology advancements in our cameras. That was the big question last month. The vast majority of you were agreeing uh, that lots of the newer features in the camera aren't useful. Many of you are frustrated like us uh, that you have to pay for them, whether you like it or not. Uh, but Marcus, I think you've got a suggestion actually for a new camera feature which you think would be useful. Yeah, I was driving back from Ireland and I suddenly thought, you know, off the back of running a workshop and seeing where people were struggling, that why is it not possible, and Harry, you'd be a good person to answer this, why is it not possible for a camera company to eliminate the, the, the meter, the, the exposure meter in a camera, which obviously is always reading a, a mid-tone or 18% grey, because people don't understand that, okay? And just link the exposure to the histogram. So you, you, you should be able to go into a menu in your camera and say, I want you to expose for the highlights. And in that situation, the camera would put the exposure so that the histogram was as far over to the right, but not touching, not clipping any highlights. And then if the shadows block up, so be it. Or you could go to another mode and you could say, I want you to expose for the shadows. And it would then do the opposite. It would expose for the darkest tones. And if the highlights blow out, so be it. Or you could have a best of both worlds and go, right, just g give me the best you know, middle ground. And if the highlights and the shadows block out, then so be it. But that would be so much more accurate and easier for the user to understand. I don't say often, but that is actually a really good idea. I'd never, I mean, it makes complete sense. And I mean, surely it's, it's just because it's tradition, isn't it? 53 years of life on this planet and I've actually come up with a good idea. <laughs> You could, have, you could have a little black button, a little white button, and then a button in between, and have physical buttons and just press them. Expose for this, expose for this. That, that's a good idea. It is a good idea. Uh, and so that would make more people buy that camera than putting in AI or any other nonsense that nobody's ever asked for. Theoretically, but people, it's like I just bought a bottle of uh, shampoo recently and I was looking at the front of it and it was in big letters it had some posh word that we kn that they must know nobody has ever heard of but they put it on specifically because they know it looks impressive it sounds like it's got a technology that's going to make your hair do something magical and it's the same with cameras people might not use AI or even particularly like it once they get it but the fact especially if you're going in not like you guys you guys know better possibly people may be going in a bit fresher they just think ooh this is exciting this is going to be good you know that's what they're going to go for if they're at a certain level as opposed to people who maybe have a bit more experience oh, you think you're getting value for money don't you you're getting out all these cool features and you think you're getting a value-packed uh, product but then obviously realize that you 90% of it and so you know all these various menus that you end up having 
day to day you actually don't don't need you know because all you end up needing is to be able to adjust the exposure yeah the things that came out of the podcast last month were the security issue uh, so manufacturers putting some kind of password on a phone or making it so that you uh, sorry on the phone on a camera um, or making it so that if it's more than uh, you know a certain proximity from your phone for example it just fails to work so that if it's stolen the person who's stolen it can't actually use it and therefore hopefully that will deter you know deter people from stealing expensive camera kit and the other one was improved weather sealing we've already spoken about um, you know smartphones and the one thing that they do really well is weather ceiling so um i was explaining to harry earlier on i dropped my phone in the bath the other day and it was under the water for a good 10 seconds why were you why why do you have your phone in the bath come on i mean just he's called me relax. from the bath before and it's horrifying oh, no. and he tells you, can you that hear him. well no he doesn't but you can hear him you know splishy splashing with his little boat toys or whatever he has harry it was a video call it was it once it was a video call that was extremely disturbing that's just not right but no ruth i like i like to relax in the bath and play chess on my phone okay Okay. And so I, as I was getting out of the bath, I, I dropped the phone and it went underneath me. And as I, I was kind of like flailing around thinking, oh, no, my phone's oh, you know gone. And gosh. it was under there for a good 10 seconds before I managed to get it. And it's, it still works. I haven't had to put it in a bag of rice or anything. It's just been perfect. So if that had been a camera, it would have been written <laughs> off. Right. Let's swiftly move on from that into this month's big question, which we put up on our socials uh, a couple of days ago. Is the DSLR dead? Short and to the point. So we've got some comments from you guys. Uh, from Facebook, first of all, Caroline Cash said, it better not be dead. It's all I have. And having not won the lottery, it's all I will have for the near future. Andy Sweeney said, my Canon 5D Mark IV still holds its own. I can print football pitch size if I need to. Why do I need to spend more money? No, my camera's got a lot of life left in it and built like a tank to last for years. Mark Tariff said, as a choice for a new camera system, then yes, he's agreeing that DSLR is dead. Instagram, Craig Macefield said, although I moved to mirrorless two years ago I still love my DSLR for me I like to keep up with technology so I probably wouldn't go back I think a lot of people would feel the same but it all depends if people can warrant the cost of moving uh, on nature's edge also on Instagram said still love my 5D Mark IV feels like driving a classic car sure it might not have the latest gadgetry but it's reliable and I know all its ins and outs and finally deans.photography on Instagram saying I would say yes definitely all manufacturers are phasing them out gradually now I have uh, a Canon 5D Mark IV. I've got a DSLR. I have got zero plans to upgrade. It's an excellent camera for me. Does everything I need it to. You know, I can get better lenses if I want to increase the quality from that side of things. Um, but what are your guys' takes on this? Is the DSLR dead? Well. Uh, I still use a DSLR and I won't be upgrading to a mirrorless camera just because I can't stand You're, you're a EDFs. bit of an oddity though, Marcus, because you've got a I lot I know of I am, I know <laughs> I am. But okay, but if you look at the photography online team, okay, then James still uses uh, a DSLR. Ruth, you still use a DSLR. I still use a DSLR. It's only Harry and Nick that have gone over to the dark side and, and have gone mirrorless. But turning this to a serious debate, Harry... What would you say the advantages are? Because I, I can't speak, because obviously I've never had a mirrorless camera, but what would you say the advantages are of swapping over to a mirrorless camera for, for yourself? For me, purely, it's only because of my wildlife shooting and because it comes down to hit rate and success with focus. I can still achieve those images with an SLR, but if I want to spend less time on a certain project achieving a certain shot, then I get a higher percentage of keepers as it were on my mirrorless r5 if i was only just shooting a landscape or travel type images i would shoot on the 5dsr which you still use i mean in fact i you know last maybe last year the year before at some point i was looking at those on ebay because i thought oh, that would just be wouldn't it be great just to have that take one camera out for, for for landscapes work but you know it's just having multiple cameras but if that was all i was shooting it's still hard to beat the quality, well, it's impossible to beat the quality out of a camera like the 5 DSR, as we looked at on the main show with the quality comparisons. So it's a very specific case for me. Yeah, going back to that point, Canon have still yet to manufacture a camera that takes a better quality image than the 5 DSR. So we've proved that beyond all doubt by comparing it to you know the more modern mirrorless cameras. Um, the Nikon D850, I, I haven't compared that to any of the Z cameras, but 
the fact that the Z cameras didn't beat the 5DSR then proves that the D850, which was equal to the 5DSR, also hasn't been uh, you know, trumped. So it's certainly not an image quality thing. I think a lot of people went over to mirrorless because it was branded as saving weight which wasn't actually true but the lenses i know are lighter but even though the bodies might not be and only some of them you know the the stuff and again we use canon as the example because i know the lenses they've got the 28 to 70 f2 lens phenomenal lens but holy moly it's like carrying a ton of bricks in your pocket it is an unbelievably heavy lens so so that you know it was a fallacy of saving weight in many cases you know i've got a mirrorless camera with some mirrorless lenses my bag is still just as heavy my back is still just as ruined if i really wanted to save weight it's a case of switching to something like the om systems as a micro four thirds and, and you actually do get a saving there but i think the question overall we kind of have to approach from two has to be approached from two angles if you're approaching it from the the business end then the the as a industry then yeah dslr is dead in the fact that pretty much all manufacturers bar is it Pentax maybe? Pentax was still making an SLR? Uh, they are, but I don't think Pentax are a major player in the digital market, so we can discount them. No, no I mean, it's, it's not an SLR thing a lot of people will be buying, unfortunately, but everyone else is phasing out you know, support and production of you know, both SLRs and the lenses. So from that regard, you know, the pragmatic answer or the simplest answer would be, well, yes, it is, because essentially we're not making any new ones but as our whole audience uh, seem to agree is that it's not dead in the sense that for most people, it's still doing the job. Yeah. It's now incredibly cheap to, to pick up secondhand. Well, I say that actually, the 5D4 that a lot of people mentioned in the comments there, that is still quite an expensive camera to buy secondhand. Purely like, well, I guess it's like buying a classic Land Rover. People love that old, you know, the old shape and the old use of it people are so intent on avoiding mirrorless that the price of secondhand 5d mark fours is quite high and it's more expensive to buy a secondhand 5d mark four than it is to buy a new canon mirrorless camera in some cases the new r7s r10s and some of these small cameras are way cheaper than a, a 5d mark four which i i quite like actually so hold on to your one ruth because it's worth a fortune i think we've actually got the between us we've got the whole series of of the canon 5ds don't we i've got the 5d i think there's a there's a one a two a three and a four so you never know the whole system in 10 years might be extremely valuable yeah we could sell the whole lot for a set at christie's auction <laughs> but no this whole uh question was the catalyst for this question was actually uh from a report that came out online where um, I think you have it on your screen in front of you there Harry I can't remember the, the the guy's name but he basically said that after doing a bit of research he was quite surprised as to the amount of professional photographers who are still using DSLRs or choose to use DSLRs over more m modern mirrorless cameras so he was saying that the DSLR is definitely not dead in terms of the usability of them but in yeah. terms of the manufacturer of them, then yes, it de unless someone like Nikon or Canon do a dramatic U-turn, then yeah, it's definitely dead. And yeah, so it was, uh, what was his, I've got his name here somewhere, Callum Carter, Digital Camera World was the article anyway, who said he recently sat down and spoke to some of the leading professionals in sort of uh, portraits and travel. Um, none of the names are relevant to me. I, I don't know that industry. Robbie Lawrence, uh, Asma Wei, Weigui and Sherry Nickel all using the same camera, the Canon 5D Mark IV. Um, so again, you know, it, it keeps coming up, but you know, that camera is getting close to 10 years old and is obviously still producing the, the goods. All right. Well, if you want to have your say on that, again, feel free to leave a comment on uh, whatever podcast platform you are listening on next month. If you join us, we are going to be asking, are photos ever truly finished unless they are printed? So if you've got Ooh. a say on that. Yeah, I know. I, I, I have imagine. a lot to say about that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Hold it in, hold it in till next month. Uh, keep an eye on our socials. We will be putting that up um, in the next couple of weeks and you can have your say on there. We're just about at the halfway point and uh, just to mention as well, 
some of our listeners from more interesting parts of the world. And obviously, every podcast, uh, we seem to attract a bigger and bigger audience, which is fantastic. Uh, most popular countries, of course, are the usual English speaking ones, which we understand for obvious reasons UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland. So, hi to you if you're listening from there. But the biggest non English speaking countries this month were actually Germany and Sweden. So, guten tag if you're listening uh, from Germany. Brad Dag, I believe, is Swedish. See, I did my research. Ooh, I have no very, idea on the pronunciation nice. of that one. Um, but I'd like to say hello as well to listeners from some unexpected places. So, this month we've got three, or last month I should say, three missing listening in Latvia. I didn't get my Latvian good day, so good day to you guys. Oman, there are two in Oman. Somebody is listening in Kazakhstan, all on his own <laughs> or her on her own. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago as well. There's somebody listening over there, so it's fantastic to have you well, guys. I'd like to listen in Trinidad and Tobago. Lying by a pool somewhere with a yeah, yeah glass nice. of something nice and cold. Uh, if you're one of those listeners or any of the others, of course, please do feel free. Get in touch. Let us know about yourself. Always interested to know who's listening. You can go to mc2photography.com various ways to get in touch in there or of course like I said just leave a comment whatever platform you're listening on and thank you to those who have left comments on last month's podcast Lorna got in touch by email just to say um, she's been loving the podcast the most recent one gave me food for thought regarding the complexity of cameras she said I'm getting used to my new Z8 and everything I use is in the custom menu I'd hate to be a new photographer though trying to navigate that Uh, Jonathan Jones 4566 uh, got in touch as well said paying to unlock features is the worst idea in the history of bad ideas. Microtransactions have ruined everything they've been used on. Imagine taking photos of your family's special event and getting the message. You've taken 100 photos to take an additional 50 photos. Please pay £5.99 or something similar. That's from uh, Jonathan Jones, uh, disregarding what we were talking about on last month's podcast. Uh, Regarding the show, Photographer and Line, our main show, of course, Sandro Bedenobrecht. I'm so sorry, Sandro. Sandro, I think Beden Obrecht, 8509, um, got in touch saying, great show, lots of good information on the wide angle. We were talking all about wide angle on last month's Photography Online. And he's got a question for you, Marcus. He said, did you cook all the stuff for your staff? Now, he's talking about the uh, still life subject that we're doing, or you were doing, analog photography with the large plate full of fresh veggies. What did you do with it all? Yeah, no, I, I didn't I didn't cook it for you guys, I, but it was consumed by myself. <laughs> If that's any Is consolation. That, it was eaten. It's not like a fish that you chuck back in. Oh, well, at least it wasn't put to waste. Ananda Sim said, watching from Australia, uh, loving the production values of the channel and the personality of each presenter. Personalities? There are personalities. Excellent. The topics are great. And somehow the whole show gives me the feeling of reading a British photo magazine pre-internet days, which to me is very high praise because that's kind of what we were thinking when we first started the show. It was kind of magazine styly and just having the, the various features, the various, like I said, personalities in there as well. So thank you, Ananda. Uh, over in Australia, down in Australia, um, for your feedback. We always love it. Keep it coming. We are going to move on, though, with the podcast and our next feature. What is the point? The point. Ah, oh, what's the point? All right, let's keep it short and sweet. Depth of field apps. Who wants to go first? Oh, geez, keep it short and then you say depth of field apps. I mean, how long have we... No, I mean, I'll keep it short. It's, it's, a, it's a small subject, but it's a, a lot of rage going on. I can see that already well, in Harry's eyes. Well, not rage, it's, but, it, but it is... I'm going to I'm going to try and be balanced about it as as I should be because it's something I, I have on my phone. I, I have uh, well specifically I use the photographer's ephemeris and there is also photo pills. They all do the same thing, and they have built into them these depth of field tables and hyperfocal distance values that you can look at. Now, the only reason they exist on my phone is for me to every so often bring up to demonstrate to people. One, that actually you don't really need to look at them or pay attention. And two, when we're sort of talking about the finer points of depth of field and it predominantly to then say, you'll be surprised how much depth of field you get. You really don't need to worry about it and be looking at tables and doing complicated maths. So for me, great as a teaching tool, but in actual use, 
never yeah you know, i've never used one in in anger yeah so the thing that they they lack and i've said this before so apologies for repeating myself but the thing that the crucial question which they all fail to ask is how far are you going to be viewing the photo from and what is the enlargement of the photo because those two things are as important to depth of field as anything else so you know we're in an era where there's this obsession with focus stacking. And I was having this conversation with uh, customers on the workshop in Ireland last week. And I was just saying, there is no point in focus stacking an image 99.9% of the time because you're never ever going to notice that the foreground is very, very slightly out of focus because you focus you know, at three metres rather than at one metre. When you print that on the wall and you frame it at A3 size and you stand back so that you can admire it all in, in one go. You're not going to stand one inch from that photo and go, oh, look, it's a little bit soft right in the foreground there. Um, but that's what people do. And that's the problem. They edit their photos on a computer and then they zoom in and they to 100% and go all around the photo and go, oh, look, it's a little bit soft there. It's a little bit soft there. That's not how you look at a photo. Please stop doing that because you're not achieving anything other than causing yourself to be paranoid about depth the field well and the fact that 99 percent of images are, are viewed on a screen on a phone and you never you know you could you could have the shallowest depth of field ever and you actually still don't notice on such a tiny phone screen yeah absolutely i mean if you if you go back to the, the previous uh, episode of photography online where i was doing the still live thing i shot that at f64 on you know a large format camera because i thought that that's what i was going to need to get the required depth of field i actually ended up with too much depth of field so a, a lot of people they underestimate how much depth of field you can get just by closing down your aperture so instead of doing focus stacking and you know consulting an app and finding out what different distances are in focus for your given focal length and your given distance etc just forget about all of that and focus a third of the way into the scene or a third of the way up the frame assuming that the closest part is at the bottom of the frame and the more distant part is at the back of the frame and close your aperture down and shoot like that and that will 99.9 percent .9 of the time it will solve the problem and you'll never need to focus that you'll never need to use an app so um yeah what's the point there is no point stop doing it is the answer Harry obviously agrees with that. Well, that was probably one of the shortest What's the Points we've ever done, actually. We will be having another one next month. I would actually like to have your suggestions for this. If you've got any ideas of things that you think are useless or maybe you think other people might think they're not so much, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Stick it in the comments or pop us an email, uh, contact at mc2photography.com. Suggestions for next month's What's the Point? We would love to hear from you. Let's move on to some stuff. Does the world really need this? Now, Marcus, you came back, as you said, from Ireland uh, not too long ago with lots of things to talk about. But one particular item that you said that you came across, which had you slightly fizzing, what was it? Yeah, so Benro, which uh, a well-known tripod maker that we're all familiar with uh, and they make some very good tripods so this is no this is not knocking benro in in general um they have a new tripod called the theta i think that's how you pronounce it t-h-e-t-a and i'd kind of seen this um or you know seen reports about it uh, before going out to ireland but i'd never seen it in the flesh and when i read about it i thought actually that could be quite a good idea However, uh, sometimes you need to see things in the flesh before you can get an accurate, you know, uh, kind of uh, conclusion as to whether they're useful or not. And I have to say, this is probably the worst product I've ever seen in the history of my 53 years on this planet. So uh, it, it, in case you don't know what the Benro Theta is, and that's probably the case because it's not really well known yet, it's the world's first auto leveling tripod. So the idea is, is that you set this thing up and then you can put it down, you press a button and it auto levels. So it's got motors in it, it's got a battery in it. Um, you press the button and it will auto level the, the tripod. Now, again, on paper, that seems like a good idea, but I can guarantee that this is a product which has been designed by engineers and not by photographers, because in practical terms, it's of no use whatsoever. So customer on the trip to Ireland last week had one of these and she'd never used it before so she it was a brand new product um, I don't think they're easily available at the moment Harry I, don't, I think they're still on pre-order well they're on they're on pre-order on sort of Kickstarter so um... yeah so I don't know how she got hold of it but she's definitely had one so I was quite intrigued to you know to look at it 
But um, you know, to cut a, a long story short, the company are claiming that this is super fast to set up. Now, that's just not the case because out of eight people on this workshop, without failure, this lady was always the last person to set up her tripod just because it's so fiddly to use. And after two days, she actually got so frustrated with it that her friend who was traveling with her um, kind of sensed the frustration and, and offered to swap tripods. So um, she said, look, I'll use this one. You can use my tripod for the rest of the trip. But once they'd swapped tripods, the lady, who, the, you know, the second lady who was using it was then always the last person to be able to set up a tripod. So it wasn't like a user thing. It's a tripod thing. Um, and I was looking at it. I mean, I had to go with it a couple of times and I just thought I'd just give up straight away. So the, the conclusion was that the lady who bought it is going to take it back and ask for a refund and has got no interest whatsoever in, in using it going forwards. But you're right. It sounds like a good idea. What, what was the problem apart from the fact that it took a little bit longer to set up? OK, well, they've got a video online and I've showed this to Harry just so that he can you know ap appreciate what I'm saying here but they time a guy the same guy setting up three different tripods one tripod is a, a like a lever lock tripod uh, you know where you pull out the levers and that releases the leg and then you clamp the lever shut to lock it again another tripod was a twist lock tripod which is the one that I use and I think most of us are kind of familiar with and then the third one was this Benro Theta and there's a clock running and simultaneously he's doing you know, all three of them at the same time, but in three different videos. And I was pointing out to Harry how slow this guy is going on purpose when he's doing the other two tripods. So when he's undoing the lever locks, rather than undoing them all at the same time, because when the tripods close, those lever locks are right next to each other. So any sensible person would just open them all in one movement but he was doing them singularly one at a time and then extending the tripod really slowly and then clamping them one at a time which obviously you have to do because now they're uh, you know a foot apart from each other and then he was rotating the tripod and doing that to each individual leg the twist lock one was a joke because he was undoing each twist lock with two turns and then pulling out each section individually and then doing it up two turns and the result was that it took him 25 seconds to set up the, um, allegedly, to set up the twist lock and the lever lock tripods. I've timed myself this morning setting up a four leg, leg section twist lock tripod and it only took me 12 seconds. So I've halved the time that it took him in the video to set, set up a tripod. Now he set up the Benro Theta in 10 and a half seconds, which is faster than I've managed to do you know, my own tripod. However, he didn't auto level it which then takes another five, six, seven seconds. So he's only half set it up, isn't he? Well, also, I don't. It's not the it's not the world's first auto leveling tripod because we featured one on this podcast right at the start of this year by Edelchrome, and they, they. But it was a larger tripod for filming, and if I remember, the conclusion from that was that actually that's quite a useful product because for some of the filming applications and the way it all has to be set up. Having a, an element of auto leveling and and motorization is actually really useful. Speeds up, so, you know, the setup of some of the film shots. But uh, I have watched the video, and this looks like one of those classic cases of something that worked perfectly fine. Tripods have functioned for a hundred plus years, and somebody's now come along and said, "Right, let's stick an electric motor in that. That'll that'll do the job." And it's just overcomplicated something that didn't need to be overcomplicated whatsoever. Yeah, it's solving a problem that we never realised we had. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and and the fact that, well, I think they're selling it as a travel, as an auto levelling travel tripod, aren't they? So you've got a travel tripod then with what well, presumably electric motors in, which aren't light. So you think, how can... I mean, I don't, I don't know the specs actually. But, you know, before I start making claims, yeah, but it's not it's not the lightest of tripods because I I pick this thing up and you can feel the that you can feel it. It feels really kind of you know solid, but not in a sturdy way, in a kind of you know hefty way. But yeah, you've got a battery in it. I don't think the battery is particularly heavy, but you've got three motors, one for each leg. And the thing is, when you're pulling out the legs uh, or, or you know trying to adjust them manually you can feel the resistance of this motor turning inside the leg and uh, you know I've got no evidence to base this on because obviously I didn't break the tripod but I could understand it breaking very easily it doesn't feel like the thing that's going to go on for years and years and years and still be working in five years time so I'm assuming that once that motor once one of those three motors goes it's either going to be a very expensive repair job or you just throw it away and buy another one so does the auto leveling itself work well 
Uh, yeah, it works well, but it doesn't take more than a few seconds to just level a tripod in the, you know, in this, look, about three years ago, I came up with an idea that I approached King Joy, the tripod company that I use. And I came up with this idea that they could put electromagnetic uh, locks in their legs. So I said, look, all you do from a photographer's point of view is you hold the tripod, you hold the, the top of the tripod above the ground at the height that you want the camera. You press a button which releases all the, the, the electromagnets and the legs then drop down by gravity, not by motor, but by gravity until they hit the floor. And then you let go of it. And hey, presto, you've got a tripod that's perfectly leveled in less than a second okay and they loved the idea but they did a little bit of research on it and they said that it was just going to be too complicated and their, their feedback was a tripod is a very simple thing it's a support for your camera with three legs let's not complicate it and i thought <laughs> okay <laughs> and so there we go there we go yeah but that's exactly where we've gone here so the idea that i had i think is a sound one but in in practical terms it's just overcomplicating something that doesn't need to be mm. overcomplicated so, so benro never got that memo but but, uh, yeah, they no, did. But the, again, I, I, I just want to emphasize. You know, we we all use King Joy tripods. We sell King Joy tripods because we believe that they're that you know the best out there on the market. All things weighed up, if King Joy didn't exist, I would probably be a Benro user because I consider them to be a, a good brand. So this is not knocking Benro; mm. it's just knocking this particular product. And I would urge people not to buy it until you've gone out and used it in a in a real world scenario. Because it may be that someone out there goes, "This is this is the best thing ever," but I would be surprised if that person exists. So don't rush out and buy this because I think you might be regretting it. And you know the problems don't end there. It's got a fixed head, so you can't change the head out, and the head is really woeful as well it's it's just a horrible thing on a on a spindly center column which doesn't really offer that that much stability i mean you could, you could go on there's a there's a hundred things wrong with this tripod but we've addressed the main one and that's where it you know we, we can end it because there, there's no point to it basically okay so there is no point does the world really need it no. uh, definitely not no. definitely not all right well moving on to something i found actually which is quite an interesting thing uh, i don't even know how i came across this but miniature nikon camera collectibles that come out of a vending machine. Harry, you had a look at this as well. Explain to us what these are. I, I did. It is right up my street. I think they're they're brilliant. They're, they are literally just tiny. Um, I mean, they are less than an inch tall. So they are properly miniature replica Nikon cameras. So they've done two analog cameras, two Nikon old style film cameras and two of the Z series cameras. The lenses even come off, you know, they're properly detailed um, with all the writing on the lenses, the buttons, the dials, but they are, I mean, I mean 20 millimeters tall, 0.8 inches if you're in the States. So yeah, I mean, obviously you can't take a picture on them. Um, they are just model collectibles. And, but I've got no shame in saying it is the sort of thing that if I saw in a shop, I think like I'd, I'd stick that on my shelf. And so I think they're really cute. As far as far as I know, because they're it's all made by one of these you know Japanese toy companies um, that they're predominantly only available in Japan out of these uh, vending these toy vending machines that are very popular over there. And uh, from I've done some some conversion from yen to dollars. And I think it equates to about four dollars. You know, put some yen in turn, and you'll get one of these things coming out. It's ran these these toy machines that they're in are uh, random, so you never know which one you're going to get. So it's a bit like it's a bit like Panini uh, stickers in an album. You you just buy a pack. You don't know yes. what's in the pack, and you just have to keep buying packs until you've got all the stickers. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, if I if I was over in Japan and I saw that in a vending machine, I'd be like, yes, please, I'll have that. And I. I don't, I think very quickly you'll see them on reseller sites. People have gone, you know, bought them, found them and are now selling them on for $20, $30, whatever online or on eBay. I just, you know, and I think people, people would probably buy it. Um, I'm not sure I'd pay that much for one, but certainly if I found the vending machine, I'd stick a few dollars in that and, and see which one I got. I think they're very, very cute. So perfect little gift i would say for a photographer in your life um hint hint ruth you know christmas is coming up <laughs> yeah but you're not in you're not in ruth's life harry hate to break the bad news 
that's, that's, that's true. You put it on a tiny wee shelf. Marcus, you've got very large shelves full of um, cameras behind you, none of which are models, I don't believe. But would you have one? Uh, no, I, I like all my cameras that I buy. I buy them for functional reasons. So I use every single camera that I have. Um, so I don't I don't have cameras. I mean, there are, to be fair, there are a couple that are broken, um, which I'm just not going to bother getting repaired. They just sit there looking pretty. But, but they weren't bought to sit there and look pretty. No, but mostly um, I buy cameras to use them and not to just sit there as ornaments. So no, not really for me. Yeah, but you're heartless. <laughs> yeah, I am. That's a whole other podcast. Um, there is a new camera. It is made of Lego, which we mentioned a few podcasts ago. There's a few Lego cameras out there. But this one actually works. This one shoots film, Marcus. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, well, you've just basically stolen the article there. Um, so it's the Lego ZH1. It's a fully functional camera, which you build yourself. Uh, it's been designed by a photographer, which is always a good start, rather than some lab technician at Lego. Uh, it contains 595 pieces, so it's well out of your uh, intellectual spectrum, Harry. Um, <laughs> the camera uses 35mm film and has uh, the option to shoot half frame or full frame. Now, I don't know whether you can switch that um through you know in the middle of the roll or whether you have to set it before you load the film and then the whole roll has to be shot in the f same format uh because he didn't mention that but if it if it can switch between half frame and full frame mid roll that's actually a really useful feature which you don't really get on any other camera apart from the Hasselblad x pan which you know that's that's why it's so expensive it's a five thousand pound camera because of that now it has uh another couple of options as well it has a real lens i think it's just obviously a plastic lens rather than some high you know quality optic but you can also go for a pinhole option as well so when you're building it you can choose to put on the the plastic lens or you can just go for the pinhole option depending on what kind of photos you want uh, it also features a a shutter button, a film advance winder, an accessory shoe, um, and then, like I said, has the switch for the full or half frame mode. So, you know, it, that would be a great gift, I think, for someone for Christmas. Um, I couldn't find a price on it, so you have to do your research if you want to find the price. But, um, yeah, it would make, make a great gift for somebody who's into their cameras to be able to sit there uh, on Boxing Day and build their own camera and then go out and take photos with it. Hint, hint. So it's a miniature, a non-working camera for $4 for Harry and Marcus, a Lego yet to be priced, but hopefully cheaper than the Hasselblad x -Pan. Yeah, but you can imagine, you can imagine photographers, you know, photography dads like myself, um, you know, buying this for their kids as a, a kind of incentive to get into photography, because it's a, it's a great way to get your first camera to be able to build it and then take go and take photos. And they're not going to be the best photos. We know that. But, um, you know, kids are still going to love that and they're going to get the satisfaction of going and, and making something that they can then go and take photos on it's brilliant yeah absolutely so does the world need it i reckon so yeah i'd, I'd give that a big thumbs up harry i want one i want I've, I, I hadn't <laughs> seen this before i've just just looked at the the link online and um i definitely want this for christmas Excellent. All right. So the world does need it. Again, there will be links for all of the items we're talking about, as well as the news stories we mentioned earlier in the show notes. So check those out if you're interested as well. A uh, final item for does the world really need this is another camera. Um, Harry, what one's this? Well, yes, yeah, so this is a, uh, I say a, a proper camera, but a camera from a established brand. It is the new Rolly 35 millimeter af so it's a brand new film from the established band rolly and uh it is as we had the new pentax camera a couple of months ago reviewed by the wonderful shiana um, but this is rather than half frame which the pentax was this is a full frame 35 millimeter film camera and i mean it's quite a lovely looking um you know very retro styled camera and i think it comes just with a fixed 35mm f2.8 lens, but it has auto exposure, auto focus using LiDAR, which is quite different to autofocus systems uh, in most modern cameras. And uh, it seems really just uh, aimed again at people looking to have a little explore into film photography 
without too much of the um, sort of hassle of, you know, some of the manual exposures, manual focus, um, and just, you know, whacking a bit of film in there and going out and just shooting a roll of film um, when you're when you're out traveling. I mean, I, I, I think it looks pretty good. Have you had a have you had a chance to look at this, Marcus? I, I, yeah, I have seen it. I mean, it, it's very small and compact, so it'll fit in your pocket very easily. It's got a good lens on it, and you know, it takes full frame thirty five millimeter photos. So the quality that you should be able to get out of this camera should be right up there with anything else. So it's by no means a, a toy, and the price I think is about seven hundred pounds. There's several models out six six hundred and fifteen pounds apparently on the. Uh... Uh, but um, I mean, it's a it's a European website, so it depends on the conversion. But yeah, it's six to seven hundred pounds. Yeah, so I mean, it's not it's not a cheap camera, um, but obviously it's cheaper than a digital uh, version of it. And then of course you have to pay for the film to go into it and pay to process it, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're not you're not going to save any money um, by buying this camera. But it's it's another great kind of you know sign of optimism i think you know earlier on in the show we were talking about how camera sales have slumped in the last 10 years by 82 percent even though we're not sure whether that means that there's 18 percent left uh, or not but it's great to see new you know new cameras like the the rolly 35 and um like you mentioned harry the the pentax uh 17 coming out because you know all of these new cameras are going to contribute to giving people more options in in buying more cameras and getting those numbers up um so that you know we're not sitting here in another two or three years talking about another 80 percent decline hopefully we're talking about you know an increase in camera sales uh i th- i think it's a lovely uh you know it's to say it's not a toy it's a proper camera but it's it's the it's priced at that sort of level. You think, oh, wow, that's not it's not outrageous, and it's certainly something that you know you might buy for someone as a gift if they're getting into photography rather than a four thousand, five thousand pound top of the line digital camera, and um, you know, and it looks easy to get to grips with. Yeah. So here we are. Um, I know I hate to mention the C word, but, um, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, maybe two or three weeks after it's been uh, released, then Christmas is going to be on the Ah. horizon. And we've given we've given you two fantastic suggestions there, the Lego camera and the new Rolly 35 and maybe the the Pentax 17 as, as ideal stocking fillers there. Stocking fillers, four dollars possibly, Harry, um, but not six hundred and fifteen quid going in anyone's stocking that I know. I don't know if I love anyone that much. Oh, you, you should come around my house for Christmas, Ruth. We have a blast. Can I put a stocking up and might I find a rolly in there on Christmas morning? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I doubt it. It'd be one of these pin badges again, un- un- underneath some Ferrero Rocher. <laughs> oh well, I can't beat a bit of Ferrero Rocher. Anyway, that is our feature. Does the world really need this again? Like I say, check out those links if any of those sound interesting to you. In the show notes coming up in our next normally we say in our next YouTube show as I mentioned in the last month's podcast and again on our live show uh, we've got one more show coming up before the end of this year we've kind of finished the regular series of shows for the year we do have one more show though we're going to be going to Venice James and I filmed a feature on Hidden Venice so some of the locations that you might not know about if you've only been to the more popular tourist spots in Venice we're also going to be doing a feature on shooting long exposures in fading light So you can look forward to that. We will pop that up on YouTube at some point between now and the C word. Uh, So keep an eyeball out for that. Make sure your notifications are on. Next year, we've got lots of stuff for you to look forward to on the shows when we relaunch in January. A few things in production right now. Uh, We're going to be looking at how to eyeball exposure and get that right every single time, upping your skills there. Uh, How to shoot fewer photos and increase your hit rate. How to sell your gear, which post-Christmas might be a very real thing for you guys what to look for in a tripod a non-motorised one would be a good start (laughs) yeah exactly Uh, the most useful rule in photography uh, film photography should probably say the inverse square law no that's in any Um, photography no no, the inverse square law you can apply it to any any photography at all It's, it's one of the most useful things to know Okay, a lot of people have been asking about this over the last couple of years actually so we are going to be doing that in our shows next year. Uh, Plus we've got a brand new photo challenge which you might have seen some stuff on on social media in the last few weeks and that's going to be really good, it's going to be running throughout the length 
length of the shows next year and we're going to have some uh, city guides as well in the pipeline hopefully for next year so that is all coming up in photography online the podcast will carry on through so we've got a brand new podcast next month as usual so very much looking forward to that but we're going to wrap up today thank you so much uh, Harry and I was going to call you James there Harry and Marcus uh, for joining us today next month I'm not sure who we've got next month another couple of experts anyway Uh, who's laughing I'm not one of them anyway another couple next month so looking forward to that but until then take good care and most of all take good photos the photography online podcast 